Um, we've got uh, Peter and Tron here tonight to walk us through um, open systems thinking or OST perspective on agile transformations. Um, so if you've come for the, the something else, then maybe uh, stay here anyway, because this is probably even better, okay? Um, systems at play, uh, the, the meetup group's been around now for a couple of years. Uh, we're way beyond the 350 members now and uh, across all of the continents except Antarctica. 30 countries, 95 cities, and probably some people calling in from space as well, for all we know. Um, really been quite successful. Uh, obviously, it's more than just uh, myself, Ali, Dad, and Mihail. It's all of you guys as well, and all of the speakers that support us, which uh, lend their time to us, and uh, we're very, very thankful for that. Um, if you enjoyed tonight, let your friends know. Uh, it's always great to keep building the community and try to keep supporting it and spreading the word about systems thinking out there. Tonight, I'm not going to read through all of that. Um, we've got Peter and Tron, and I'm just going to throw over to Peter, uh, actually, just to introduce himself rather than me try to, to bore you with trying to read through all that or try to describe what Peter's been up to. Peter. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, yes, for the last 25 years, I've been um, applying uh, the methodologies, two key methodologies from open systems theory. One's known as the search conference and the other one is the participative design workshop which uh, I'll be talking about later on um, and giving you some examples of how the participative workshop leads to um, highly uh, adaptive, agile and innovative organisations and I'll give three uh, case studies on that. So that's basically me. Cool. Um, Peter actually comes to us uh, from just over near Albury today um, at Wodonga Way, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he's actually one of our, our, our local systems thinkers, as it were, and it's really great to, to see uh, to see that happening as well. Uh, but uh, Tron comes from us to us from a, a little bit further away. Um, Tron, do you want to uh, introduce yourself, please? Yes, sure. Uh, not so local then. Now, uh, <laughs> my name is uh, Tron von Oplan. I'm from uh, Oslo, Norway. Um, I have predominantly worked as a, uh, as a software developer and architect uh, since the late 90s or something like that. I uh, got into uh, Agile in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, something like that. Um, and I've been frustrated with Agile ever since, actually, because it, it was a wonderful experience to begin with, fantastic. And then it sort of went downhill from there, basically. Uh, so um, I have been curious about finding different ways to sort of improve our Agile way of, uh, of working. So I spent numerous time last few years reading papers and all that stuff, uh, including stuff by Peter here. So uh, I'm actually really honored to be here because he, he is one of my heroes. So um, uh, I'm really looking forward to his uh, part of this presentation today. Uh, so I'm more of a student than a practitioner, but I want uh, probably what will move into practicing this stuff at some point. Cool. Sorry, Dave, just um, Tron is pretty humble as Peter <laughs> is. You know, not only he understands so social do. and technical system, he also play as you can see, air guitar really well. So he's an artist, an engineer, and also social scientist. So unfortunately, uh, he's already married. So <laughs> cool. Oh my goodness! You're never going to leave <laughs> that picture down. I'm sorry, Tron. It's... No, I have to use that now. <laughs> oh my goodness! Cool. Thank you. Um, so if you haven't already, or if you aren't aware of it, uh, Systems at Play has a YouTube channel. Um, this uh, presentation tonight uh, this, this, uh, will go up onto YouTube uh, when we get around to actually editing it uh, down to a reasonable size if it goes too long. Uh, it's also got all of the previous uh, presentations and talks that we've had, as well as panels uh, up there as well. I was looking at the other day, actually going through Gene Bellinger's work and trying to remember what he said and um, on Systems Dynamics. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there, uh, all the speakers that we've had, including Michael Jackson and quite a few others as well. So have a look at that if you get a chance. The uh, QR code is there for you to scan. Uh, we'll give you a minute to do that if you like, and then uh, subscribe if, if you feel um, so inclined. Also pasted it in the chat, guys, so you can click oh, quickly. Thankful. Great. I'll trust that you've all uh, signed up to our YouTube channel. <laughs> And without um, too much more ado, I'm going to just give you some basic rules. 
Uh, please stay on mute um, unless uh, you really need to speak. Uh, basically, we don't want to have a whole lot of background noise. Uh, the presentation will be recorded and made public, as I said. Um, if you feel like you have a burning question, the speakers will probably pause at certain points and in, in invite people to, to, um, uh, to join in. Uh, there will also be time at the end for Q&A, okay? Any questions before we start? Cool. I'll uh, stop sharing and I'll, I'll throw over to Peter and Trond. Um, take it away, guys. Thank you. I'm going to start off uh, and hopefully not spend too much time so I can leave more uh, for Peter. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So uh, as I said, uh, I've been doing this for for for, for quite some time, and I uh, actually I'm not sure if I met the manifesto first. I don't think I did. I think actually we met the practices first. Uh, I think it was in, as I said, early mid two thousands, um, and I really enjoyed it back then. <laughs> not that I'm not, not that I'm not you know, enjoy it now, but it, it has sort of turned different um, because in the beginning I felt that we were so energized by it, and we sort of sort of saw it as a democratic grassroots movement. That was something that we picked up and say, oh, in the teams and we wanted to sort of figure out how to work better. Um, so it felt more like a sort of a revolution more than something that was put on us. Um, but it has changed. It's sort of become sort of almost like a table stake now. Every company has to be agile somehow. They have to be able to say that we are agile. Uh, so it has sort of grown to be a sort of industrial thing. Um, so my question is how successful has it really been? Uh, it, for me, it's a it's a mixed bag. I said uh, I sort of lost lost the energy for it, to be honest. And I hear people claim that agile is dead, and I'm, I can't say that I disagree, <laughs> honestly, because I think it has sort of weared off. At least what what it was and energized uh, how, how how energized I felt I was in in, uh, in the beginning. And also, I feel there has there has always been sort of lack of a scientific foundation to it. Uh, or even theoretical foundation. Yes, we have the manifesto, and there's a, there's a there's some lineage back to 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 TPS and and and, and lean thinking and stuff like that. But I still feel it's random. Uh, so I want to <laughs> quote Kant: "Is that the experience without theory is blind?" So uh, I think we are so that's where we're moving now. I think I, I, at least I hope we are moving now with this uh, this meetup as a sort of good start because. Agile has had problem scaling, as we all know, um, probably well. Um, so yes, it was created for the teams, so it worked for the teams, but it doesn't cover the whole thing, uh, really. So it's really good at this, this tiny little thing. So I love this slide by, 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 uh, by, by this guy. Who, he, he talks a lot about uh, flight levels and see that we need to look at the different uh, levels of the organization, also the processes, and if we can't just focus on the one thing. But the thing is that Agile is very, it's by design only focused on that thing. So scaling it is actually kind of hard and probably not suitable. Uh, and also I think we should be reminded of the Agile is server-centric. It was written by, uh, the Agile manifesto was, was written by software developer content consultants. So even when they say customer, they don't mean the end customer, they mean actually the people paying for, for their services. So the whole thing is that uh, it creates the functional silos as we see here because it's only a part of the handovers and all that stuff. Um, and not to slag off this one in particular, but I think that we have sort of, the biggest problem is that, that the gross movement is that it's gone. It's uh, been re replaced by a bureaucracy again. So it, it initially, initially it was kind of participative. Uh, I actually felt that in, uh, in the beginning at least, that that sort of, we were sort of forming, coming up with ideas. Oh, somebody heard about pair program, let's try that. And somebody did, did that. And oh, the, something about sprints, let's try the iteration. So, so, we, so we tried things. And we even the Scrum Master role, nobody was certified Scrum Master. We actually rotated the role in the team. Like uh, this week is your as Scrum Master, next week is mine, is mine and all that stuff. So it was really participative. So self-organizing as we like to call it. Today. Um, so, um, uh, and also, when it is this big and this, in, this industrialized, it requires experts. So often you have to bring a huge amount of, of, uh, of a horde of coaches in to sort of help any, uh, to get any agile going at any, in any large companies. So the companies have been in the last few years, so had lot of large consultancies coming in and say, this is how you should work. So all this stuff could, could be get a, uh, comes to the idea that if somebody feels that agile is that, that sort of the, 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 uh, the original idea is sort of long gone. Uh, and I feel I sort of I feel the same. Uh, I think I don't know who said it, but I said that Agile was in a, initially thought of as a lightweight uh, manifesto. It was like uncovering things, and it was also on the values and stuff like that. 
So there is an oxymoron here. So if you do this particular example I have here, scaled a lightweight framework. <laughs> so uh, there's a bit of an oxymoron. So uh, in this presentation, I actually almost by accident came across this term called social technical architecture. It was it is used in in our in, a, in actually in sort of my part of our neck of the world as a, to illustrate the. Uh, the effect of Conway's law, as somebody probably also some of you know, that the sort of the communication lines in your company actually affects the, the solution design that you end up with. So uh, these are actually coined independently of what I've ended up spending the deep, deep rabbit hole that I went into, which was social, social technical system thinking. So uh, there are actually no real relation between the two, but it, they use the same word. So after many papers, I, I think I actually started with this uh, from, from uh, Tristan uh, from Tavistock Institute about the coal mines uh, in England, because that was the first one that came up on, on Wikipedia, I believe. But after that, I read, read a lot of papers, and I see that there is a lot of parallels between uh, what they call SDSD, which is Social Technical System Design, and Agile. Uh, it has sort of had the same democratic movement uh, coming from the bottom, finding new ways of working, realizing that there are, there are different ways to do work. Uh, and in that sense, since they started like 50 years before Agile, they, I think there's a lot we can learn from, from, uh, from, uh, from social technical system thing. Um, it's especially uh, get, getting away from, from the hierarchy and, and, and getting into self-management teams and all that stuff. We're, and, and they have proved scientific studies that this way of working is by far the best uh, because you then get the joint optimization of the social and the technical aspects of, of of a system. <clears throat> so, so this is basically the social technique was coined in this first paper from 51 by Tristan Bamford. So no local optimization, right? That you don't optimize on the social or not of, on, on the technical, you have to jointly optimize them, which means that probably none of them are going to be optimized by themselves, but together they're going to be optimized. And just a quick mention there, since I'm from Norway, uh, one of the biggest projects and probably most uh, defining projects in the evolution of what uh, what is social technical system design was uh, happening in Norway. Um, so the, the, this was the, there was a Norwegian uh, program that as was started, and it was a huge one. It went all the way to the top, so it was uh, driven by the confederation of, of, of trade unions and, and and employers, and even the government joined in at some point. So that started in '62, the Norwegian Industrial Democracy Program, and this. Uh, this poster is from uh, our first of May demonstration in Oslo in 1966. You probably can't read what it says there, maybe he can, but it says that uh, uh, iron workers demands increased democracy uh, in, in the society and in the workplace. So, you know, it was a hard, uh, it sort of got politicized at some point. It was really focused on the, uh, the democratic aspects of, of social technical. So, the Tavistock Institute. Uh, headed by Fred Emery was brought into this project to sort of do, to, to, to design the experiments that I was going to do. So, and this was a lucky, actually lucky occasion for the Tavistock because in England, they hadn't been able to run the experiments. In Norway, they were actually asked to do it. So there was a lot of learning done there, even so much so that some of the learnings they were put into law. So uh, Peter's gonna, probably gonna mention it later, but there are, they identified six intrinsic motivators that people have in work. You probably have heard of Day and Daniel Pink with this autonomy, mastery and purpose. They are all in there, but there's more to them. So this, these six are more than that. Uh, and they are also written down and set in, into the Norwegian uh, work environment. Act. A question how many companies actually are fulfilling this, but they are actually breaking the law if they're not sort of, making sure that, that your job is reasonably demanding, that you have the opportunity to learn, that you can have an area of, of, uh, of decision-making, that you have social support, and you have opportunity to relate your work to, 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 to your social life, and that it brings yourself to a desirable future. These are the six ones. Uh, Peter's probably gonna have a more modern version of them, but these were the ones that was identified in the Norwegian Democracy Program. So they have become, uh, by many claim they, they are sort of stone tablets on Norwegian uh, human resources or human relations HR. So uh, what you've probably heard of as a Nordic model is, is very much based on this. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because this is something I wanna leave to Peter, but uh, now we move into the open system thinking area because the open system, system thinking or system theory is sort of an extension to social technical system design. Uh, the social technical system I was very much like I was very focused on the team, so the system in itself, but it didn't 
consider the, or did at some point, but it didn't explicitly consider the environment as much as, as uh, open system theory does. So uh, I'm just gonna give a few heads up what sort of my core learnings from open system theory is. And I think it's that this illustration shows is that there is a system which is your company and it's fully exposed to the environment. And it's not only the industry, the closer the task environment as it's called it, but also the wider social fields. So when workers come, come to work, they actually bring their whole self to work. So there's all, uh, I've heard talks about you should leave your private life at home and when you come to work and stuff like that, but that is impossible. You know, so we can't do that. So we, it's a continuous in, uh, sort of integration between the, the, the system and it and this environment. So, so this is the open systems uh, way of viewing it. So the system and the environment are actually mutually de determinative. That you, uh, the, the system is affected by the environment, but also the system is then also defining the, its environment. So it's both ways. So it, it, there is a circle of uh, dependency here. And another one is that they, as they saw in the, uh, in the gold mines, is that a different way of working. You don't have to have this uh, hierarchy that we are used to, the DP1 uh, is right there. Again, Peter is going to go more into this later. So the alternative is actually the, the sort of the, the self managing teams. So we are probably familiar with this somewhat in Agile, but the thing is that we put self-managing teams in a hierarchy, hierarchical structure. So we, we create pockets of something that looks like uh, DDP2, but it's still stuck in a DP1. And this is sort of um, uh, the mix that people also is going to go, go to probably uh, touch upon is that they actually don't mix these two. So, so which means that we create something that is often referred to as less affair when we do that. So anything goes, there's, there's confusion added to it. So who is, who's actually running the show? We think that the autonomous teams are self-governing, but no, they're really not. If, the, if, if, if push comes to shove, they are usually not. Another one is that uh, you can scale this. Um, you wouldn't only have agile teams at the bottom. The whole organization would be uh, constructed as, as a, as a self-governing team. And they would negotiate at, as, as peers. They would, they, uh, there wouldn't be a personal dominance. There wouldn't be any, any somebody telling other boss to, uh, how, how to do it. And also all this design is done participatively. So it's some of the techniques that, that Peter mentioned, it's just really core to this. So uh, as I mentioned, the start of the Kant quote, the second heart of it is that the theory without experience is merely intellectual play. So we have to have, have some, some, some practice design on you know, play. And so open system activity also have that. How, how should you transition from, from this hierarchy into this, this, uh, this hierarchy of, of, of uh, autonomous teams, also self-management teams? Actually, uh, I'm running a little bit over, so I'm gonna end with this. This is a good quote actually from, from social technical system design paper, a fairly new one from 2018. I think it sort of uh, illustrates what, what sort of what we want to do here. Um, so SDS design uh, was intended to produce a win-win-win-win situation. This is a good one. Human being uh, more aware, uh, we're more committed. Technology operated closer to its potential, and the organization performed better overall while adapting more readily to the changes in the environment. So for me, that is sort of uh, summarizes what SDSD was, uh, the attention of it was, and what OST is. There is one. Thing that makes it different here, and that is the uh, the sort of the mutual dependency between this the environment and the system. So here, here you sort of get the impression that you only adapt, but uh, in a, in a real system you actually actively adapt. So so you actually try to affect the environment because you are you are actually being a system. You are actually producing the environment, so you are actually then affecting it in a considerable way. So I think we need to sort of anchor. Uh, agile in social uh, uh, social sciences, specifically open system thinking, I think, uh, and because of, and and we need to get back to that sort of democratic way of self organization because the, the, as OST and research since the fifties has shown, this is actually the ex, uh, excelled way of working, especially when there is a huge uh, amount of complexity around us, uh, uncertainty. Yeah, so with that, I think I'm going to actually hand it over to Peter. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, thanks, uh, Tron. Um, yes, yeah, so we're talking about open systems thinking perspective on agile transformation. Um,
So this slide here, the one in the middle there with organisations as open systems and the environment is often um, the uh, diagram used to describe open systems theory. So as John was talking before, there's an extended social field, a wider environment that we all operate in. Then there's our particular industry environment. Uh, so if you're a telco, it'll be the telco industry and organisations learn about the environment and then as they plan and go forward in it, they, um, they actually change the environment. So I just talk about that uh, over the next uh, minute or two, but on the, uh, the right hand side, you've got our environment now is uh, highly unpredictable, uncertain, and there's some of the um, characteristics of the environment that we're all familiar with. And on the left-hand side, in that type of environment, organisations need to be able to continuously adapt and motivate employees, et cetera, to lean and agile and so forth. And that re to have those characteristics has, um, it requires system-wide cooperation. So not just in one section of the, uh, the organisation, but right across, if we're going to be able to adapt have high levels of agility and innovate in that highly turbulent, unpredictable environment. Um, just a little bit about the uh, open systems. Uh, so open systems theory was first conceptualized in the 1960s by renowned social scientist, Fred Emery from Australia and Eric Trist from the UK that um, John mentioned before. So during that period, the, uh, the 1960s, you, you may have um, heard about what was called the Cultural Re Revolution. So all sorts of things were happening. Um, the environmental groups were occurring, uh, women's liberation, et cetera, et cetera. That was uh, happening in the, during that Cultural Revolution. And it was creating what's called discontinuous change in that social field there on that diagram. So values and expect, uh, expectations were changing in that field uh, and it was leading to people changing their minds about what they believed in. And that started to affect the products and services people would buy and use. So that was having a great impact on um, businesses of the day. And today that extended social field is highly unpredictable and rapidly in ch changing. Sometimes it's changing in real time. And the digital technology revolution that we're all part of is amplifying this uncertainty. So for example, digital technology is not only influ influencing what products and services people will buy and use, but how they'll buy them. So it's creating lots of uncertainty for uh, many organizations. So to um, help businesses and communities survive and prosper in this rapidly changing environment, Fred Emery and his partner, Marilyn Emery, uh, continued to pioneer the development of open system theory back in Australia. And thanks to their efforts, we now have two important methodologies translated from this uh, open system theory to support businesses in high levels of uncertainty. And as I mentioned before, the first is uh, the search conference, which is a large group participative strategic planning process. So you have 30, 35 people in the room analyzing the environment and um, looking at their system and how it operates in that environment, how it functions in the, that environment to create what was called active, adapt, active adaptive strategic plans or goals. So not only are you adapting to changes in the environment, you, you are, as an organisation, actively adapt, uh, influencing that environment for the betterment of the organisation and the wider community. So an example of that might be uh, how Apple influenced the uh, external environment on how we purchase music. Um, so when people uh, participate uh, in a search conference, um, you get wide, le uh, great levels of uh, 
commitment to to the plans that they develop. And they also uh, learn how to continually analyze the, uh, the environment, look for changes in it, and look for opportunities to um, influence it. So it's a very important part of um, producing an adaptive, agile, innovative organization. And you come up with these, at what we said, active, adaptive, strategic goals. But if you've got a, a, a bureaucratic organization that's rigid and structured, you can't adapt quickly enough to those, uh, the goals that you've set in place and, and the changes that are taking place in the environment. So to execute those active, adaptive, strategic goals, the organizations must be designed for continuous adaption. They must be designed for high levels of um, agility and innovation. And to do that requires that system-wide cooperation. And to achieve that, uh, Emory and uh, both Fred and Marilyn Emory developed the, the, what's known as the Participate Design Workshop, which is the second uh, important methodology translated from open systems theory to, to change design principles from design principle one to design principle two. And that's what uh, I'll be talking about for the rest of this presentation. So the aim is to um, introduce you to the organizational design principles. And if there's anything that uh, you take away from this presentation is to uh, under design these, can understand these conceptual design principles. They're critically important, especially if you're trying to set up agile self-managed teams. Um, we'll talk about the participative design workshop and it's an open SDS method for changing organisation design principles. Um, the participative design workshop centres on, as it was mentioned before, op jointly optimising the social system and the technical system to maximise the, the uh, performance of the business. So jointly optimising basically means getting the best fit between the two systems. And uh, often you'll uh, change management um, methodologies like TQM and business process re-engineering, etc. They focus primarily on the technical systems, how we convert inputs to outputs without uh, considering the social system. So you sub-optimise the system and therefore you don't get the expected uh, performance results that you're looking at. The other thing we'll look at is how design principles affect intrinsic motivation, cooperation, and productivity and, it, and also mental health. Um, performance improvement examples, as I mentioned before, we'll look at three different case studies and the planning and preparation steps required to change design principles. So the first thing that we look at in the participative design workshop is what's known as the intrinsic motivated, so the six basic human needs of work. And this is your social system, if you like, of the organisation. So, Emory distilled, um, there was about 30 of these uh, criteria uh, that were around in the 1970s. He distilled them to six. Uh, and the, there's elbow room learning on the job and variety. So they're what's known as optimal. So people can have too much or too little in their job or just the right amount. And it, it's, it's critical when you're designing work that you design it so people get the right amount of elbow room and learning on the job. That's learning on the job is being, being able to set challenges or goals yourself and then getting feedback to see whether it worked or not and variety. And that varies from one person to the next and it very, changes over time. So how do you design work that um, optimises those, um, those first three criteria there? And the second, uh, a lot of three criteria, mutual support and respect, meaningfulness and desirable future are maximal, meaning you can't get enough of those um, uh, criteria there. So meaningfulness has got two components to it as well, socially useful, which means does society value the work that I do and do I see the whole product? Um, mutual support and respect is about uh, if I'm having a problem, my workmates chip in and help out and vice versa. 
um, and desirable future? Is there an opportunity for me to grow uh, and personally grow within the organisation? And we've done hundreds and hundreds of these over the last 25 years. And what you find is that the people at the operation coal base level score very poorly on these because they have little control over their work. Um, often you'll find people at the front line have negative scores on those optimal uh, criteria there. They have little room to make decisions. They don't have much chance to learn on the job and there's little variety. Then you go to the next level, the middle level, supervisors, first, sec second uh, line managers, and usually they in the plus side of things and those optimal scores, we've got, we've got too many uh, balls to juggle. There's just too much happening. And then when you get to the top of the organisation, they get pretty good scores because senior management have a lot of control over their work. So if we look at why we get uh, poor scores in the bureaucratic structure, and I think you're all familiar with this type of structure, we've all worked in it. It's, uh, it's called Design Principle 1. And um, there's two key features to that structure. It's a redundancy of parts model, which means um, it's a system. So how does it uh, have redundancy built into it uh, so it can cope with different demands? Uh, there are more parts or people in that system than the system actually requires at any point in time. So um, um, you get jobs that are broken down into lots of small parts and, you know, on a production line, you could have uh, an operator just operating a punch machine, putting in um, bits of steel and out the other end comes a widget. So um, if that person fails, just get another one in treated like a cog in the machine. So it's a redundancy of parts model. And the other key feature of it is responsibility for control and coordination is at one level, at least one level above where the work's being done. So when you look at that structure with respect to those six criteria there, um, if you look at people A, B, C and D, uh, their work is controlled by S1 what standards, uh, the timeliness of the work, et cetera, have to follow their job description. So there's not much opportunity there for A, a B, C and D to have uh, decision-making with variety and learning. It's just uh, they're dictated to by their, their job descriptions. A, you do X and do it to timeliness and quality uh, set told to you by S1. And um, S1 also coordinates those uh, people, so who's going to be working with them, et cetera. And if you look at that structure, it, it's really a, um, a competitive structure. It's creating internal competition rather than cooperation. Because if A, B, C and D, they're actually competing with, with each other to get to the next level of the hierarchy, uh, S1. So if A is uh, having troubles and B notices it, well, B's, really, and if they're competing against each other, B's really not going to go in and help um, to make A look better than B. So you get that internal competition occurring and therefore um, lack of cooperation and communication problems. So I've spelled out more of this in um, a briefing paper if you want to uh, analyse it further. Uh, the other key feature here is S1's in charge of the goals of that section, not A, B, C and D. They just worry about the jobs you've got to do. So though that particular structure, as I mentioned before, does very little for uh, the six criteria, especially if you're at the bottom of the organisation. The only way you can turn that around is to change the design principles, and that's to shift the responsibility for control and coordination of work to those who are actually doing the work. So A, B, C and D are now responsible for X, Y, Z and W. And this, rather than doing uh, small tasks, they're, they're working on a whole task now and they're responsible for the goals of that section. And um, the redundancy is built in by having a redundancy in function. So rather than A doing X, A, a could do X, Y and Z or Y, Z and W and so forth. So they work out the, the, the optimum mix of skills that A, B, C and D 
to uh, meet the goals that they're responsible for now. Uh, the jagged line means that, uh, look, the hamburger look, it means that that's uh, symbolising getting the best fit between the social system, the people, and as measured by the six criteria and the, uh, the tasks they have to do to maximise the performance of the, the business, which are the goals that have to be met. So that's those two design principles there are like the DNA of the organisation. And uh, as I'll point out uh, soon, often organisations get mixed mode. They set up um, design principle two structures within design principle one. When you have mixed mode, you get a lot of tension that occurs and a misunderstanding of occurring within the organisation. So when you're designing your self-managing teams, you've got to avoid that problem of mixed mode. So we'll talk about that in the case studies. So the participative design workshop, this is what it looks like. It's typically two days uh, and it uh, goes through a, a briefing one. Um, the senior management uh, spells out the strategic goals and challenges of the business. So that creates the scene for the uh, participate design workshop. Then we measure the intrinsic motivators. We look at the skills required to achieve the goals of that section. And we do a high level uh, process mapping technical flow. Um, so that's where you've got the social system, which is the intrinsic motivators and the high level process mapping, the technical system analyzed in that briefing one. Briefing two looks at uh, drawing the existing DP1 structure. So you've got to identify all the employees, some uh, organisations, that people, some people don't know who works where. So often we have to put down people's initials to identify them all. Then we get, then, we, then the groups uh, redesign their new DP2 structure. Um, and then to make it work, the practicalities, what are the team goals? And they have to relate back to that senior management briefing that they heard of day one of the workshop. Uh, what are the training requirements um, to meet the goals? And um, often when we do these uh, PDWs, there's not much training required. You know, normally the skills are, are within the group. Uh, what we do look for is identifying the central skills and making sure there are at least two people that have those essential skills. What's the career path structure look like within the, um, the, the team? What are the terms and conditions of employment that uh, may need to be um, adjusted? Often you'll need to, if you've got some sort of legal agreement between uh, in the workplace, you'll need to uh, spell out that uh, people will be working in self-managing groups. Um, What's the mechanisms for coordination? So how do we communicate? How, does, how do you find out that one team's doing some fantastic work and how is that shared across the organisation? Any other uh, requirements to make it work? So teams are not getting information quickly enough. Uh, it's coming out every fortnight. We need it daily. So that is a role for middle management there to go and sort that out. And there has to be improvement for uh, those intrinsic motivators because if you don't get those right, there won't be the human interest to see the job through. There won't be people won't be motivated to be to be more agile and to be innovative and adapt to uh, the changing strategic goals. So that's a typical uh, PDW, but it's very flexible. I've run it across um, uh, workplaces uh, that operate in um, a 24 hour, uh, seven days a week mode, and you can't take people out of, you can't shut a ship down to do a, a PDW. So you, you've got to design the, uh, the workshop so that you can um, do parts of the organization uh, and across different shifts and timeframes and, um, and then have an integrated one at the end of it. Um, no, and normally it's a bottom-up approach too. So uh, I'll go through it in the last slide what's required, but uh, the, the CEO and the senior manager have to be on board with this type of change. And once they've um, 
they understand it and the implications to the business and they give it the tick of approval, then it's a bottom-up approach. So you start at the bottom and what comes out of these uh, workshops is at the bottom is what the next level of the hierarchy uh, needs to do to support the uh, teams at operational level. So like I mentioned before, information's not uh, there in a timely fashion, etc. So uh, I'll talk a bit more about that and what's required to um, plan for a, a change in design principles. So a couple of uh, or three examples, a manufacturing, a telco and a disability. I'll quickly go through these because I'm not too sure where, what time are we, uh, how much time we got left. Dave, have you? It's uh, about a quarter to seven now. So about another, what is it? I think we're going to seven with the talk. So okay. 15 minutes. Okay, thanks, Doug. I'll go through these. Um, so uh, this was a uh, Queensland uh, manufacturer of detonators uh, in a remote part of Queensland because they're dealing with ammonium nitrate and um, can't be blowing up the local community if they do have an accident. So um, their head office of this organisation was, was in Sydney and the um, head office management wanted to um, source the product from China because it was much cheaper to source it from China. And um, uh, the, the plant management at the remote location said, no, uh, we don't want to lose our jobs. We reckon we can get it down to... Um, uh, a unit cost that's uh, better than what the, you can get it from um, Chinese. So the head office management gave them a six month window to prove that they could do it. And they started off uh, changing their, uh, or trying to set up team-based structures. They were, they were a lean, uh, they were operating uh, under lean uh, management principles, but what they did do is um, they set up, and we did this analysis before we even um, started any participated design workshops. They um, discovered that, or what we discovered was that they had set up, uh, in their efforts to set up uh, self-managing teams, they set up DP1, that parts of the organisation were bureaucracy, other parts of it were self-managing teams and other parts were laissez-faire, which were basically teams without any goals and people just didn't know what to do. And laissez-faire is the worst form of organisation you could have. It's much worse than DP1. And we were finding that there were mental health issues coming out of this uh, uh, project. Um, as a result, mainly of uh, laissez-faire, people left for themselves. It's a bit like Lord of the Flies, uh, the weak get picked on. Um, so you've got to be very careful you don't set up a laissez-faire organisation. It has detrimental effects uh, to the, the weakest in the organisation. And it was such a bad example this, uh, it became part of our mental health in the workplace project that uh, we did back in 2008. And in the paper, the, the briefing paper that I mentioned before, I, I provide reference to that um, that uh, published paper in a systems journal. Uh, so the organisation had that, uh, so there's about 100 people working in this organisation and um, that was um, the shifts. So typical manufacturing organisation. And there were lots of things falling through the cracks. Um, the worst thing was that the operations uh, supervisor set up the, the day, afternoon and night shifts, set up uh, competitions between the shifts. So there was competition to produce uh, X number of widgets per shift. And what was happening, so they got rewarded for that, and what was happening was the day shift would produce um, their number of um, detonators, which were about the size of a, a biro. Um, and any defects, they'd send it on to afternoon shift. So afternoon shift, they'd have to start fixing up the defects before they could get on making their own, um, you know, um, quality detonators. And, this, and then the afternoon shift put, send all its defects to night shift. So 
you were getting um, uh, these defects floating around the organisation, and that was causing problems with quality and timeliness. Um, so, what the uh, when we went through the PDWs, and there were four of them, one on each shift, and an integration, uh, which included the management PDW. Uh, they came up with this structure here. So um, you had the management team, the, those planning horizons there on the right-hand side, uh, the, the yellow planning was to, is, uh, was happening in uh, head office in Sydney. So the planning horizons, so um, the management team here was about six months, six to 12 months, when the blue teams were about a month. Um, so that differentiates the, um, what we call the hierarchies of function, the uh, different functions at those different planning horizons, different skills required. But the production teams, uh, they came up with this and they said, well, we won't have these eight hour goals, we'll have 24 hour goals. So, so maintenance, uh, production and the materials distribution teams all had 24 hour goals. And that, that alone increased uh, productivity by 40%, and it didn't require any um, increase in, um, in overtime either. So uh, the guys on the shop floor knew how to improve things. Um, management thought they couldn't even get a 20% improvement when we started off doing this. Uh, but you're surprised how, how smart people are at the coal face. So that uh, structure, um, it um, improved not only uh, the unit costs, and they got down below the unit co the unit costs that um, the Chinese were bringing in. It. They also um, and it also improved the motivation, or what was called employee engagement, and that was measured by an outside company called Right Consulting, and they uh, it went from thirty two percent to fifty five percent in in less than six months. So it had a dramatic uh, impact on not only the performance of the business, but um, the mental health of people working in that organisation. So that was uh, one example is explained more in the uh, brief paper. The next uh, case study was uh, a telco, a large telco. Um, uh, <clears throat> and it was having trouble with its managed network services, the silos within this organization, just too many things are falling through the cracks. And so much decision-making had to go up and down the silos before anything got done, that it, it was causing uh, one of their big customers, uh, and I was, it was spent millions and millions of dollars on this uh, telco each year. Um, it just caused all sorts of problems for the, um, the airline uh, it caused um, planes to be delayed, customers' uh, bookings to be delayed. And the airline company said, we've had enough of this. Um, we don't want to go with another telco, but if you can't improve your performance, uh, we will. So uh, we were called in to see if we could help improve the managed network service. And um, we said we can, but it, 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 the telco was so big, there was 100,000 people there when we started working with the organisation, um, that you could not change that overnight from DP1 to DP2. So what we said to senior management is that we need to be able to set up a, a greenfield site, a new entity, um, and, then, um, and then work from there. And we, and uh, this slide here shows how we communicated it to senior management. So they, they're all your, um, or some of your silos. And what we said that we need critical people out with those skills, WAN, ISDN, SDN, et cetera, to, um, to uh, be part of this new entity that would help um, deliver exceptional performance to your, um, uh, airline customer. And um, so they had a look at that, 
they, they said, yeah, we accept that. That looks good. We're not, uh, you're not hiring new people. You're just taking uh, experienced people out of the silos with the work that they do and, and, and doing, uh, working with a new structure. So that, that yellow, green and blue uh, operations team, we went, they went through a uh, participative design workshop. And as I said, they normally uh, run for two days, but this particular one ran for three days because the technology was so complex. It was, uh, it took us one day to actually map out the, uh, the, uh, the, the, tech, the, the process flow because it was um, internet protocol and it wasn't just one dimension, it was multi dimensions and um, you had quality assurance and quality activation process flows. I mean, it was so complex, this organisation, there were hundreds of service engineers and project managers uh, required to coordinate all the different uh, skills across those silos. And in our workshop, which was run not far from Sydney or Lake Macquarie, um, isolated, and what you do in these workshops is you try and have a social island where people are not getting contacted by their workmates and, and so forth. Um, we, had social, we had some of the uh, service engineers in there and they put up what their service activation and um, service assurance workflows uh, looked like. And that, this is how the business was running. And when the operators at the, at the coalface looked at it, they said, no, 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 it doesn't work like that at all. This is how it works. The service engineers had about a 10% fault in um, service activation and assurance. So we went through and uh, went through the process and they came up with this structure here. And um, it was it it was uh, so it was successful from day one. They had service level agreements all over the place. And this particular was a customer care team, it's what they called it, uh, was meeting 100% service level agreements uh, from day one and it met them day after day after day for 12 months. And the, the uh, airline customer was so impressed with uh, that performance that they awarded this particular customer care team and the um, and the structure, uh, the senior management structure that was involved with it, uh, their supplier of the year award. You know, no one, and that was beating companies like Boeing and and uh, other big high profile uh, multinational companies. So, um, I mean, this didn't all happen in one day. There was a lot of preparation and planning beforehand. There was search conferences done for this. Um, and one particular, it wasn't a search conference, it was a, what we call a unique design. It was a um, taking components of the search conference in the participated design workshop. But we had to, uh, uh, one of the uh, big players in this um, um, restructuring was Cisco. But Cisco was not only a customer of the telco and a supplier, but it was also a competitor. So we had to run a, a a one-day workshop with senior management to um, set up the policy framework, if you like, of how to deal when there was conflicting issues around competition and so forth. So it was a lot of preparation and planning in this, but with, as I said, within 18 months, um, the team won the, um, the Supplier of the Year Award and it, it was so successful for managed network services that uh, it led to other big projects that involved big banking customers and so forth. So the, the other important thing about this is that we, we were very conscious of um, not having mixed modes. So this Greenfield site was set up in its own uh, building uh, in Pitt Street in Sydney, actually. And... Um, it was completely separated from the huge bureaucracy, telco bureaucracy, so that it could operate as a DP2 structure without the conflict of DP1. Although there were some people in the bureaucracy who were trying to kill it because they were threatened by that type of structure. Well, um, Peter, just wary of time. There's about yep. three minutes to, to seven. Okay. 
And the other one was just a uh, disability care provider. This example just shows you it's not only manufacturing and, and, um, and uh, service like the telco, but you can also uh, community type groups as well. So this is a very complex one uh, involving more than 2000 people across the country. Um, that's just a typical, typical example of um, what the structure looked like. That's a new structure, the DP2 structure. That's what the, um, the integrated structure looked like. Um, so those, the yellow, the green and the blue, as mentioned before, they're what's known as hierarchies of function. It's a DP2 structure. Whereas in a DP1 structure, you have dominant hierarchies of authority. And this organization had eight levels. So we ended up going down to five levels. So this one's still a work in progress. Um, so the, the planning and preparation, if you're going to move, change design principles, the key players need to understand what they are and their consequences for intrinsic motivation, health, innovation, and productivity. Um, so you actually have workshops um, and get the key players to uh, even assess their own intrinsic motivators so that they understand uh, what that means in terms of the social system and how it needs to be improved to uh, improve the, as I said, the um, adaptivity and uh, agility of the organisation. Uh, organisational, organisational health assessment, that's optional. We often do that. That's where we picked up the mental health problems. Uh, the CEO needs to communicate to all employees about the active adaptive strategic goals and the rationale for change. Uh, establish online communications channel. We had, uh, there's lots of questions come through when you're dealing with more than 2,000 people, you need some way of communicating effectively with them. Uh, so, and critically uh, involve and seek feedback from ecosystem members. One of my fantastic D, uh, DP1 to DP2 uh, transformations um, failed uh, over time. It was so successful that its, um, its market share went from 12% to over 60%. But players from the ecosystem weren't, weren't uh, adapting quickly enough to the changes that this com manufacturing company was making and it brought down the whole ecosystem. So it's critical that you involve ecosystem members in, in the changes you, you're talking about and, and making. Uh, you establish and train an internal PDW transformation team, train the current transformation team uh, in the current environment, transformation team needs to design work for hybrid workers, uh, suggest innovative opportunities, uh, eliminate, mitigate, identify process mapping using smart technology. I talk about that in the, uh, the briefing paper. Know how to scale those agile teams. So they did not just in uh, one pocket of the organization. And if you need to uh, do what we did with the telco and set up a greenfield site, then you may have to take that path depending on the complexity and the size of the organization. That's a bottom up uh, approach and you need to establish your terms and conditions of uh, the project. Um, yeah, it's important that you establish a, a skill-based career path remuneration program, and most organisations have competency-based programs today. You also need to have a pretty good redundancy policy, even though you've, uh, a lot of middle management jobs, all those supervisory jobs disappear, and you find other middle management jobs for them, a lot of them, can't cope with the change. So no, this is not for me. So you need to have a redundancy program in place. And therefore you need to seek support from your um, industrial relations uh, tribunals in Australia, it's the Fair Work Commission. And we had on that um, last case study, the um, disability care provider, we had fantastic support from the Fair Work Commission on that transformation program. So, that's a lot to absorb and digest in um, uh, whatever it was, 20 minutes or so. But as I said, there's a briefing paper that if you want to uh, get stuck into this stuff and learn a bit more about it. And uh, Ali, Dad, will 
tell you about some of the training programs that are coming up too. So that's that's it for me. Thanks for your attention and thank happy. you. Thank you so much, Peter. That was amazing. This is probably the fourth time I'm hearing this. Every time I'm mesmerized that I just want to keep listening. Before we jump into the questions, I apologize, everyone. I just wanted to clarify something. Um, Marilyn lives in Australia. She lives in Canberra and um, she is um, at her 80s, but very sharp. We had her conversation with Mike Jackson about clarifying some of the misunderstanding Mike Jackson had, and she's very sharp. We once we get to know about Marilyn and the fact that she lives in Australia, and we, it was through Trond, and, um, and then Trond connected us to Peter, and we had some conversation. We, we, we suggested them, uh, Marilyn, to run a, a public session. And I, I, the reason I tell you this, guys, is this is absolutely for it. Is, we, we are getting no profit from this. And I just wanted to clarify, we didn't bring you here to just charge you a bunch of money to register for a training conference. For us, this is almost our social responsibility because this work has to need leave. More people need to hear about this. And what we want to do is we're organizing a conference in a training in Canberra in October, two, three days um, workshop. And, um, and all we're charging is we're just covering the costs and we want to make sure we also record the session because it will you know god bless marilyn um but um Mar marilyn but it, it is um it it will probably she she's obviously health is de deteriorating and we want to make sure we record that good news is peter is going to be there and he's run these sessions many times but peter um Marilyn and Trond will be there. Trond is also flying from Oslo just for this conference in October. So if you have any question, please, and obviously to meet Marilyn, um, if you guys are interested, just register your interest. You don't have to commit to payment or anything right now. Just tell us that you're interested and then we will be in touch as we are setting up the ticketing system and the payment and all of that. But for me, this was almost become our mission between myself, Dave, and um, and Mihal, and then we talked about the Vitron and Peter, and they fully supported it. So um, I posted the link. Um, have a look, and um, then if you had any question, please do reach out to us. Um, at a minimum, just register your interest, and we will we'll contact you. I don't want to talk more than this. Um, I'll hand over to. Peter, and then I think there are questions. Alex is Alex is still with us. Um, did you want to ask your question yourself, or do you want me to read it through? Oh, you can read it through if you like. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm just not Hi, coming Alex. on camera tonight. <laughs> oh, that's okay. So really, um, Peter, the question from Alex is: Are there barriers for companies that have boards to get them acquainted with? What would be quite radical change to some companies, Peter? Oh yeah, it's uh, you're actually changing the DNA of the organisation. So there has to be a um, hundred percent commitment to it uh, from senior management and the board in some instances. Um, so it's not worth progressing until it's led by the CEO. It might be. Um, initiated by someone from the agile community or a HR person, but at the end of the day, it has to be, um, you know, fully supported by the CEO and the senior management because you'll get some people hate it and will try to sabotage it in the change efforts. So uh, you need to have all that up front all that sort of discussed beforehand and if someone does have a charge the change how do we deal with that um so and then i mean i only talked about dp2 quickly but there are in management team you would have a, a dp2 structure where and often management teams like technical teams 
they've got specialist skills. So you can't multi-skill. You can't have a, a finance person uh, multi-skilling with a marketing person, for instance. So what you have in that instance is uh, the specialists control what happens, but together as a group, they coordinate their efforts to meet the, uh, the strategic goals of the business. So um, all that needs to be discussed beforehand. Um, so yes, it is is challenging. There's a lot of preparation and planning before you even run a uh, participating design workshop. And I find that um, running a search conference, you know, the organization might say, oh, no, we've got our strategic goals. But if you run the search conference, it opens them up to the concept of active adaptive strategic planning. But as I mentioned earlier, it galvanizes the group to work towards their most desirable and achievable future that they've developed during the conference, search conference. And they realize that, crikey, we can't meet, we can't meet these strategic goals with the structure we've got at the moment. It's just too inflexible. And it becomes a driver of changing the organization's design principles. So I often go down that path. If it's not a full-blown search conference, which is two days, then you can, as I mentioned before, you can have a unique design, which is a, a um, you might you might just analyze the industry environment if it's really um, turbulent and not spend, um, to analyze that, um, um, the wider community or the extended social field of that diagram in the uh, open systems. Um, that takes eight hours to do that thoroughly. So some people uh, might say, no, that's too much time. But so you can develop unique designs that uh, cope for those different needs. But yeah, do something like that first, get it, uh, the key players on board before you even think about a participating design workshop. Yeah, thank you, Peter. No worries, Alex. Thanks for the question, Alex, and thanks, Peter. Daniel, I have a question. I'm just going by the order of the questions. Um, Daniel, was that a question or a statement? Over to you, Mike. It was. It was a question, and um, you want to repeat it? Sure. Um, thanks, Peter, for a, a great presentation, and um, and also Trond. Um, I'm really interested by the joint the joint optimization aspect, which um, was promised that has a scientific basis. Um, it's also, I guess, a very desirable result for many people that the, the teamy structure or the team of team structure can um, outperform uh, the, the traditional hierarchical one. But when you're briefing these executives, do you explain or simply cite this, um, this result? And how does that go across? Uh, I guess the concern is that they may not only want the... Um, the, to achieve the goal of their ambitious targets, but also may be reluctant to, um, to let go of some of the, the, the benefits of, of being a top, a, a more hierarchical organisation. Uh, yep. Um, yeah, you can't get too technical with sen some senior management. Their, their eyes glaze over. Mm -hmm. um, so... Sometimes I don't even mention socio-technical systems. I just talk about um, that um, the intrinsic motivators, which is your social system, basically. Um, um, and to, uh, I mean, people conceptualise that pretty quickly. Um, I've worked with um, shocked law people who, where English isn't their first language, and they they nod, they they get it. Um, so if you can say to uh, management, look, if we don't get these right at the operational level of the business, um, there won't be the interest, the human interest to see a job through. There won't be the human interest to cooperate and communicate to each other. Hey, hey, there's an error that's come into our system that we've picked up from the customer. And usually it's the people at the front line who are picking up what's happening from the customer. Um, if it's not in their interest to communicate it, because it might make them look bad, 
they won't. It just uh, gets parked and therefore you get um, amplification of errors. What you do want is people working together cooperatively. Okay, yeah, we've got an error. We've got a, a quality issue. Let's work together on it because it's affecting our goals. So if, if you get those um, six criteria right, especially at the, uh, the front line, then there will be that human interest to get a job done, to cooperate, to be much more agile and, and so forth. So if you keep it simple like that and not, not even talk about socio-technical systems, um, you can say to senior management, you guys often get good scores in this because you have control over your work. But think about the people at the front line who have got tightly controlled job descriptions, no room for um, variety and decision-making that they want. Um, they're not supporting each other. So we need to get that right. Our current structures are inhibiting that. Um, if we move to this type of structure, uh, we'll see dramatic improvements, but moving to that type of instruction means um, we'll have supervisors and first line managers that get their nose out of joint, or a lot of them, a number of them will. So what, we need to be able to deal with that issue because in a DP2 structure, you have fewer people that are paid more. In a DP1 structure, you have many people that are paid less, particularly at the, at the front line. So it, some well, those three case studies I uh, talked about, they are in dire straits. If they didn't change the status quo, then the, the uh, detonator company would have gone out of business and head office would have gladly imported them from China. The telco would have lost a huge uh, uh, customer, which would have had flow on effects to other parts of the business. And the disability care provider, they were going broke. So they had to, um, because of the, the inflexibility and the, and the bureaucracy in that organisation. So usually companies, the ones that I've worked with, are on their last legs. Um, so there has to be that burning flat platform for change. So, yeah, I hope that sort of answered your question. Don't go with the technical stuff. Keep it simple for senior management. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, that that was that that was uh, that was fascinating. Um, yeah, the, there's there's a lot of art in the in um, in in the in the selling and. Um, and working through, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Okay. Perhaps I can read one question from uh, Rajesh DP1. Isn't uh, a healthy dose of internal competition good for people? I. Uh, well. Um, not if it's to the detriment of the uh, organisation and the individual. I mean, you can have competition between teams. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. And But you need to be able to set it up um, so that, you know, if one team is doing well, then they share how that, um, uh, what they're doing with other teams that they need to catch up. But having internal competition uh between individuals um uh creates uh, what i was saying before um um mental health issues for people um where the weak get picked on um it it creates communication problems where it's not in, in a person's interest to communicate um where there are issues, if that, that communication is going to make that individual look um, bad in the eyes of a supervisor or senior management. So it's much better to have cooperation than internal competition. Uh, you really want your competition with your competitors, not between your peers. Yeah. So that's. Would that's that 
that's my thoughts. Yeah, would that answer the question? I think we lost him. Okay. Um, we have a next question from Gideon. What are some of the challenges with influencing the senior exec who might be uh, disrupted by the change and how do you overcome that? So I think some of that was answered um, in the mm -hmm. question to Daniel, parts of that. So, so what I just learned there was um, that most of these organizations, I think, were on their knees about to be so, but uh, I'm just thinking in most organizations, it takes years for them to get to that state of uh, desperation. Uh, what are those ways whereby we can actually start to change and influence? Because in, in bigger organizations, there's more bureaucracy and people have got their own protected silos and little kingdoms, which, uh, they, don't, which, which um, they don't want anyone else to, to touch. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. That's what we had in that telco case study I was talking about before, that um, the group general manager of procurement didn't want anything to do with us um, and was willing to um, destroy the whole setup. And that's why we decided to set up a virtual company and have it separate, running parallel to the huge bureaucracy as people wanted to destroy it. Um, if they hadn't set up that virtual VP2 organization, they would have lost a major customer. Um, so that was the driving force. Um, but if you've got um, management that are uh, a bit wishy-washy about changing design principles, uh, I'd walk away from it and say, well, when you're ready to change design principles, come and talk to me. Um, uh, some managers intuitively know that the design principle structure is not good for employees in the organisation. They intuitively know something's wrong. Um, and they're the ones that, as soon as you um, show them the two those two slides, design principle one, design principle two, the penny drops for them and say, ha ha, that's what, that's what we need to do. They're the sorts of managers and uh, owners of companies that you need to work with. Um, but a lot of this is, uh, particularly in the IT space, a lot of it's been driven by the environment. I know a lot of companies, a lot of, um, Startups, for instance, they start off, start off as informal DP2 in their garage. They're all working together on the common goal. But as soon as they start to uh, grow and start to employ people, the, the only um, way they know of organising business is design principle one. But if they knew they had design principle two structure, they could scale that. They could scale what they put in, you know, as their startup. Um, so, yep, that's cool. Thank you, Peter. So another one, so Jing, apologies, I again, making a mess of your name. Um, in your view, can the org redesign approach be tried locally in part of the organization or does it need to be big bang with the CEO's sponsorship? Um, preferably, um, it's eventually the whole organization if you may not that that um disability care organization which was two and a half thousand people and was in metropolitan regional and remote locations you couldn't do it all at once but you can have a date set so we do there was about 40 pws and integration workshops in that that project so you can do all that work at the start and then you can say Right, on um, September the 1st, we've completed all our structures. This is what it looks like. We're moving over to DP2. You can take that approach. Uh, but if it's a big complex organization like the telco, um, you may uh, design DP2 organization in parallel 
to the big bureaucracy they they want. Um, it's um, it's it. It all gets back to the complexity of the organisation, um, the issues it's facing. Um, you don't have to change it all at once, but it's desirable to have everybody working in DP1, uh, DP2 if you can uh, manage that big change at once. Um, but often you can just transform business units, particularly if they're uh, sort of profit centres and operating on their own and they're part of a, you know, a big corp multinational corporation. Uh, well, I've done that before, um, just changing a business. And then <laughs> you get people copying it. I think, oh, yeah, we can set up these team-based structures and they go and set them up and they don't know what the design pictures are and they stuff it right up. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds uh, familiar. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Copying, uh, yeah, in Agile, that's copying the practices and you're missing out on principles and values. Yeah, so. yeah. Cool. Uh, from Janet, I'm curious about how the process develops the people in the system to operate differently and also what do you do with the performance system? Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's it. I talk about a little bit about that in the brief paper. Um, the Participative design workshop is um, as it's it's a participative approach. So you, it's not an expert-driven approach. You, it's a it's a, a methodology that uses the um, the ideas and the knowledge of the people who are working in the organisation. So um, yeah, it, if if you're looking at um, an organization, let's say it had 100 people, um, and this is how we designed the um, disability care program that we looked at uh, areas that ha had 100 people in it roughly. We couldn't take all those 100 people out and let the care go. So you, you take a deep slice of the organization. So that would mean you might have a senior manager, a couple of middle managers, and the rest, you know, uh, 15, 16 operators. And they would do the workshop, but they would come back with their design to the other 80 that weren't involved with the process to say, hey, this is what we went through. Uh, this is the analysis we did. If you want to, you, you can do the six criteria, add to the skills matrix. This is the design we came up with. Uh, are you happy with that design? We have that discussion, but so it involves everybody. Eventually, everybody has a go at um, looking at how that they redesign the work. So it's not a uh, an imposed design. Um, so that's I, hopefully that answers the question about engaging people in the, everybody in the workplace. I think that was that the question, or did I miss? understand uh, so I think in part I, I think what I'm really curious about is that when you post the design post implementation people will be working very differently together yeah um, it requires them to be different yeah and so I'm just curious about whether you actually address that in any way specifically um, yeah it, it Teams go through a, a maturation process. So there might be some people that have been working in DP1 for a long time and have lost all interest in the organization. And you got and then you got young enthusiastic people who are saying, yeah, we need to uh, you know get these skills and uh, upgrade our, our systems to be able to achieve the goals that we've committed to. We've made an agreement with management that we'll achieve these goals. Let's say some old timers might say, "No, nah, I'm not interested in it." So then they, I just want to, I just want to put the washers on the bolts. That's all I'm interested in. I'm not interested in these goals or anything like that. I've had enough of this organisation. So it's up to the rest then to say, "Okay, Jim, you can put the washers on the bolts. You can do the, that day in day out." Um, and we'll design the work around the rest of us to get 
the multi-skilling or whatever it is that uh, we need to achieve our goals. But and when that happens, maybe sometimes after six months or so, Jim sees, oh, hang on, these guys are got quite interesting work here. They're progressing up a career path. Um, can I put up my hand to do some more, have more variety in my work? So that person, then uh, then they can design their work to get give more variety to Jim. So it's important that the group goes back and checks on it, the six criteria from time to time, and they all sit in a, in a group to go through that one by one. So each each one discusses what they think about the decision making there in the work, the variety they've got, etc. etc. And those discussions are uh, using the six criteria uh, help people to, you know, avoid some of the, the difficult conversations that they might have um, if, you, if you didn't have that tool there. And it helps them sort of come together as a group. And, um, yeah, so, yeah, it's a maturation thing. Um, then you get the team saying, well, hang on, we want more knowledge and skill within this group. Uh, we're starting to top out in terms of our career path. Uh, one uh, big brewing company I work with, um, they ended up after about three years uh, having their own budget, which was over a million dollars in terms of purchasing uh, automated equipment, things like that. So, yeah, you see teams maturing, but maybe on day one they have a little bit of difficulty and uh, that's where the middle management who don't control and coordinate uh, can support teams, especially those who are struggling um, with, uh, you know, the, uh, how they operate. So, yeah, it's baby steps first and then you watch them grow like little kids. Like my grandchildren. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're we're actually um, we're actually at time at seven thirty. Um, I'll I'll have to run away, but we can leave this channel open. I think if people want to stick around, um, maybe one more question. Maybe we'll just open it to the floor. If anybody's um, like burning to ask a question before we 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 close down the the, meet, the meetup, uh, is there anybody who has a burning question who wants to bring it to the table? There was a, someone had a question there about a, about a link to the paper, the briefing paper. Um, I don't know about that. Thanks, Murray. Yes, uh, Elidat has posted that, guys. So yeah. that's the link to uh, give your interest for the, uh, I'll repost it, for uh, the, pre the, uh, the uh, training slash uh, conference. And if you just go register their interest, they, you will get the briefing paper. So here, uh, reposting Elidat's uh, thing now. There we go. No worries. Murray, Murray, you had a question to close on. Yes, you asked one last question. <laughs> Peter, you keep talking about transformations, transformational mm -hmm. change, but surely one thing we know is transformational change doesn't work because it's a big bang. What we need is, and Big Bang change is always deeply flawed. In fact, all design is flawed when you do it in a Big Bang way. So what we really need is continuous change, not transformational change. Well, it's, it's transformational in terms of changing design principles. Uh, that is a, it's like, as I said, changing the DNA of the organisation. And once you do change those design principles, uh, as I was saying before, you start to get continuous improvement, continuous up, um, yeah, upskilling and, and uh, so forth to meet more challenging goals. So, yeah, it is. I've done these transformations and they are big bang transformations. That's why there's so much preparation and planning done beforehand. Um, yeah. So uh, that first first uh, workshop, uh, first Peter? case study on the um, the detonator company, that was big stuff. Some people, it was such a uh, 
big transformation. There were a couple of supervisors who walked out and, and resigned. So, yeah, it is, um, it is a significant change. And that's why I said that so much preparation planning required beforehand, and you need to have total commitment from senior management. Uh, Peter? That's a, yeah. You, you can't get from a reciprocating engine to a jet with continuous change. I, I, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Well, I'm, I'm supporting the comment that it, it's, it's a huge transformation, not just continuous step-by-step -step change. You can't, you can't do a, a leap. You can go 10%, 5%, 5%, but you can't do 100% with continuous change. Yeah, but it the needs history to be transformational. of transformational. The history of transformational change from consulting companies has been very bad. And there's lots of research to show that the vast majority of them fail to achieve their objectives. And I would argue that if you're going to go, if you're going to change your engine design in a massive way, um, you're going to get it wrong the first time. You're going to have to have several goes at it before you get it right. Okay. So, so why are all of the internal combustion engine manufacturers about to go out of business? Because of Tesla because they're doing incremental improvements year after year after year, as opposed to competing with their own existing business and somebody else is going to put them out of business. Uh, well, Tesla also does continuous improvement. It just does them much faster. But Tesla itself, was not born out of continuous improvement. It was transformational. Matt, I feel like this is a uh, long conversation I, and, a, and another yes. debate. <laughs> Best done on your podcast, Murray. <laughs> I had one with Alex in which we argued about whether transformational agile, whether agile transformations work or not. And we argued pretty strongly that they didn't. Yeah, you should um, all did. go and listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. It's nice to end on a bit of controversy. Oh, controversy. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually still on this one as well, um, Murray, as to the, the nature of the change uh, and what sort of change you're going after, whether you would approach it as a, in an incremental way or in a transformational big step, Kaikaku and a Kaizen model. Uh, so making a big step change. And there are two different sort of models you would actually apply in that situation. Thing like I'm, a, I'm happy with a big step change as long as we all agree that it's going to be it's going to fail and be deeply flawed the first time we do it and we have to keep fixing it looking at all the big agile transformations that have been done at anz and telstra and nab we all know they've been a disaster after boston consulting group and mckinsey have been in and then there's a whole lot of business for all the rest of us to go in and make it work years and years of work afterwards so but but murray do those agreed but um Peter's the, the approach Peter's talking about is a bit different. So can you necessarily tar it with the same brush? Peter's doing an approach because he's a consultant who gets engaged for, you know, a short period of time to make a change. And that's the consulting model. So he he's only allowed to be in there for, you know, probably a year max, even less. Yeah, Mary, probably you're right. Uh, it'll help to read that paper and probably go through the uh, references. Sure, um, I'm happy to. This, yeah, this is a bit different as Peter mentioned, and I think Strand as well. This is, you know, based on, let's call it uh, peer reviewed research over decades. So it's a bit, it's a bit different, I think, in my opinion, sorry, that's <clears throat> just me. Yeah, just 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 a small comment from me there is I think the, the huge difference is that the, the traditional agile transformations, they do not change the uh, general the design principle. 
they stick with the deeper two, uh, no, sorry, the deeper one with, with some pockets of, of where, where they try the autonomous teams. They, the, uh, there is no real change to the structure. Uh, well, what is Peter and OST and just yesterday advocate for is that you have to change the design principle. And that is something that the design principle is, is, is sort of the huge uh, trigger to understand the difference between the two and why you can't mix them also. They can't be mixed. Uh, have to correct me if I'm wrong here, Peter, but that's, that's, no, that's, that's right. definitely yeah. my impression. Yeah. And I wonder if I could just contribute something. I've been sitting here a little bit more quietly. Um, I think, you know, Murray and Jean, you're both onto something. Um, I've been doing a lot of work around the uh, future of healthcare, especially the future of the NHS here in the UK. And one of the things that's quite clear is that incremental improvement of the silos is not going to give us a 21st century healthcare system enabled by technology. It speaks to a, a radical transformational change in the whole structure and orientation of a healthcare system. It's really about the parts coming together to wrap healthcare around the individual rather than the individual wrapping themselves around silos. So incremental improvement of the silos is never going to give us that. So we need a long-term vision that can act as a motivating purpose around which incremental innovation can point towards a better future. The danger of just staying in incremental in innovation world is that we never get to see or orientate ourselves towards a bigger picture. And one of the great exciting things about healthcare as it is in many other industries is that we can think about digital and digital transformation in two sort of simplistic ways. One is digitizing what we do, which is taking all the legacy siloed thinking and just making that a bit better and, and work a little bit more efficient. Or we can reimagine what we're trying to do in a digital world, because it affords us so many more new capabilities, data that can allow us to see across siloed worlds that we couldn't see before. So we do need to have an, a degree of transformational ambition, which allows incremental innovation towards that goal and I think what you've outlined Peter is a fantastic way of starting to build different types of ways of thinking about marshalling the activity within silos towards more coordinated collective thinking. I think what's going to be interesting is if you abstract that up to say how can different silos in an ecosystem start to coordinate their activity towards something in healthcare akin to a person-centered healthcare system involves multiple actors so taking that up to the ecosystem level i think it'd be a super interesting direction mm. thanks andy uh, there are uh, we've heard of boots boots org boots org for the yes. netherlands yeah, yeah that is a fantastic dp2 structure uh yeah. although it's grown i guess you call it organic organically from one uh, self-managing team of nurses to thousands now but there's another one in the UK that I call wellbeing teams. Um, Helen Sanderson runs that. It's a smaller version of Boots or, But from memory, mm -hmm. I think she tried to start off redesigning the, the silos within the National Health Service, but just hit too many brick walls. Yeah. So she started with one team and now has three or four teams, uh, maybe even more now. It's a few years since I've spoken to her, but yeah, yeah. Um, she'd be uh, an interesting contact for you to talk yeah. about about her history of moving towards the DP2 structures. Yeah, I'd love to find out more about that. Yeah, yeah. Helen Sanderson. Yeah. yeah, well, well-being teams. That's cool. Yeah. Well, fantastic, guys. We might uh, we might leave it there. Uh, it's just just heating up, and uh, we're going to pull the plug on things. <laughs> Uh, very good, uh, very good discussion, guys. Thanks, um, Peter, and thanks, Tron. Um, and thank you, everybody, for contributing tonight and asking uh, some truly sort of um, what say, uh, questions which actually ask us to think more deeply about how we might approach uh, DP1 and DP2 type organisations or, or systems for change. Um, thanks again. And uh, hopefully uh, you can uh, uh, give expressions of interest on the uh, link that we sent through that's whether you'd like to come along to the, um, the training session uh, with, with uh, Marilyn or if you'd just like to find out more about, um, about OST. Thanks very much. And, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye. Bye.